to scale characters. And the metrics are feats, statements, narrative, and portrayal. And I did cover these four metrics in the video I made quite some time ago, but I've decided, you know what, why don't I come back to it? And in this video, I'm going to be going over feats versus narrative, as I feel like those are the main two people I like to argue over all the time. So strap in because I'm going to get really in depth with this. But before I get into the video, if you guys like this type of content, you know what to do, like, subscribe, as I am consistent. And I mean, it's a win-win for both of us. You guys show me love and support. Yo, shout out to Kosu, man. He comes on one of my videos too. I was writing one of his videos and he, he commented on my video. Shout out to Kosu, man. Shout out to Kosu. He, bro, every video he has, bro, every video Kosu has, it's a banger. Like, it's legit a banger, bro. And it's surprising that he only has 2,000 subscribers. He should have more. Like, the videos he be having, he be dishing out, it's top tier, bro. It's top tier. It's really good videos. Like, he be having good anime takes. Well, One Piece takes, go crazy. And I'll obviously give it back with many videos. And whether it's One Piece, other animated general, or just fiction, I will go there eventually. So be there when I go there. Be there anyway, plus my babbling on me. Let's get, let's get into feats versus narrative and truly see which one is a better metric to scale by. Mm. To begin in the video, I'm going to explain feats, stem logo of a narrative, and then I'm going to come to conclusion in the end which one is better. To begin this section, we have feats, and feats is very self-explanatory and it's very easy to see since well, it happens in front of your face on panel or just in the anime itself. Now, feats can also be measured by statements, and certain statements can give a character feats. For instance, Aokiji versus Akainu is a feat for both of them, as we are told, and mm -hmm. it is confirmed that they did fight for 10 days, meaning that we can use those 10 days to measure their endurance and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now, I know off of the explanation I just gave you, feats may seem very black and white, but they're not as black and white as you may think, and especially in a series like One Piece, they can be very grey at times. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples of feats that may sound impressive when you say it out loud, but when you actually look at the context, you're like, oh, they're impressive, but they're not as impressive as they may seem. Sure. That's the thing. It's like a lot of people, what they use is narrative-wise instead of feats. My, my thing is, what we see in the manga and in the anime, those, and we, we see the feats of people like Luffy, Kaido, Big Mom, Shanks. When we see the feats, I think feats hold more weight than the narrative wise. Because, for instance, narrative wise, Blackbeard been he 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 was like being built up to be an end game character, an end game villain for Luffy to fight. So narrative wise, we think Blackbeard is gonna become like neck and neck with Luffy's power. And him, it theorized that him getting a third fruit, him getting a third fruit to you, like an octopus, mythical zone fruit. Narrative wise, he's going to be neck and neck with Luffy power. But currently, off of feet alone and display of power, Luffy is beating Blackbeard high diff. That's the thing. Just like a kind of narrative wise. He's being built up to be a possible endgame villain or antagonist for Luffy. And think about it, narrative wise, Akainu has it. He has narrative wise power and feats. Cause the feats that he has is obviously going against Kuzan for ten days, clashing with him, going toe to toe, and he beat Kuzan. He outlasted Kuzan in the fight and won. He beat a whole admiral and became a fleet admiral. So that's the thing. Another thing about it, he also has his feats. He also has his feats for against old Whitebeard. Granted, it's old sick Whitebeard. But at the same time, it is Whitebeard who had the world's strongest man in the world title. So it's like, ah. But at the same time, we add context. The other Admiral was attacking him as well. A lot of Marines are like after him, trying to kill him. So like, ah. you stabbing Garp, Smoker still being Ace, and Kid and Law being Big Mom. Now, out loud, it may seem very impressive, but when you actually look at the context surrounding these feats, they're not as impressive as they may seem. Now, if somebody were to tell you that Shiryu stabbed Garp and had Garp leaking, you'd be like, okay, all right, Shiryu's got some juice on him. But then when you actually look at the whole entire scene, 
you see that number one shoe you have to sneak up and number two mm. gub literally slammed him on his head the second after and went about his way mind you this was with no hockey or anything and then you're kind of like oh that's why it happened when you look at smoker versus ace in the bubble it may seem like oh okay smoker still made ace and ace is a second commander of the yonko mm-hmm. crew smoker must be second commander level but then when you really look here you're like oh it's just a battle of the devil fruits and that's just a pre-time skip fight where there was no hockey involved there was nothing involved it was just straight devil fruits and when you're like okay cool what happened if they fought like 500 chapters later yeah ace was slam smoker on his head but because mm. it was a pre-time skip fight and there was no hockey usage it was just a straight battle of devil fruits this is this is what i'm saying whenever you when people use the, the pre-time skip feet that's a thing bro hockey wasn't prevalent it wasn't as shown as it is now after the time skip. We know hockey was used. Like like we obviously used like a a Luffy when he used it in a war. Obviously, that was pre time skip. When when Missouri used obviously hockey. But it wasn't actually shown and it wasn't like actually displayed of them using it. That's the thing. And that's why people always use the fact Megalin, the I think he the uh the prison water, Magdalene with the, the the venom poisoning type fruit. People say that him currently, like he he would be a Luffy, like if he had hockey. It's like bruh. If it's because Magna Feeds is beating pre time skip Luffy and pre time skip Blackbeard when he had the, the dark fruit. It's like bruh. Come on now, hockey was as prevalent prevalent back then you're like oh okay now big mom versus kid and law may seem a little better than the other two but when you really look at the whole scenario you're kind of like well it's not as impressive as people had to hype it up to be number one big mom wasn't going all out she didn't use any type of hockey during their fight and number two it was a ring out they didn't actually beat her she was still conscious and she was still ready to fight it's just the fact that the bombs got to her meaning she was pushed off of the island they didn't actually defeat her themselves and so now when you look back at those three feats you're like oh okay yeah i get what you're saying now it's not like as cut and dry as you may think and that's why feats need to be looked into to where you can be like okay the authenticity of this feat is pretty good now when you're scaling off of feats there are many things that need to come into play to obviously make the feat stand out and look good Number one is the statements behind the feet. So if there's any statements that hype up the attack or hype up whatever's going on, and it's patrol behind the feet. So if that character is really strong or the attack has a certain patrol, so it's like, okay, this is an attack that everybody has to move out of the way of. Now, a perfect example of this would be Zoro blocking the double Yonko attack. And I'm going to use this feat and I'm going to dissect it so all of you really understand how this feat works. Mm. Now the patrol behind the feet is huge. Despite to Yonko, like that's something that you need to worry about. But then obviously you have the statements and the statements back it up even further where they're like, we need to dodge, we got to go. Like this is an attack that any of us can block. But as we know, Zoro jumps in the way and blocks the attack. Now, how long he blocks it for is very important as when they are teleported after, Kid says, depending on the translation, it was a second or a moment. Now, what a lot of people like to do is they like to stretch this feat and say he blocked it for a long period of time or longer than how long it was stayed in the story. I think well, it wasn't. It was pretty obvious that when when, when Kaido and Big Mom did a Conqueror's Code at combined attack, and it was it was heading towards the supernovas, and last second, Zoro clashed with it. Now on panel, that's, that's a thing, because you gotta remember some stuff is shown on panel and some stuff is off screen. Just, just like how the Blackbird versus Law, when Blackbird and his commander was was um started fighting Law and was jumping him. We seen him start clashing with Law, and then we went off screen, and then back on screen to where Law is defeated on the ground, all bloody up. And Blackbeard and his commanders were all bloody up too. They was bleeding as well, but we didn't see the whole fight. Just like how we didn't see the whole the whole clash for real. Well, we we seen it. It was like like in real world time. It was like. Mm, about a minute. Because Zoro, he clashed with the attack. He was clashing it and he was holding back the attack. And then it exploded. And it was said that Law, he he, he had heard been teleported everybody out the way. But Zoro still got hit by the attack. 
and got damaged by it to where it broke his ribs and damaged his whole body. Yes, the feat is impressive. Blocking a double Yonko attack, even for a second, is a very, very impressive feat, especially since it was just with his base arm and he did that. But with that being said, it isn't to the extent that many Zoro fans like to hype it up to be, meaning the feat series i'd say another way you can go feats is by comparing other characters feats and then using those other characters then up cool marco is able to blitz queen but he's still in his perception in his base now sanji later blitzes a hybrid queen who we know is definitely faster than his base and not only does he blitz queen he perception blitzes him but what we need John Bazon, and so he does that in his base. As you can see, what I've done is I've compared a feat against one character between two people and seen which one is better. That is one way you can use feats to power scale as well. That and Cracker. Both Doflamingo and Cracker try to hit Luffy with sharp objects, but the difference between both of them is the fact that Luffy is cut by Cracker while Doflamingo can't cut Luffy. From this, we are able to see who has better hockey. And obviously, as we can see, the one that has better hockey is Cracker. And with that being said, I feel like that's the end of the feats section. I know that there are probably more things that I could go in depth with with feats, but don't worry, I'll save that for the end. When that's, I'm true. that's true. Cracker has feats because he fought Gear for Luffy. He fought Gear for Luffy. I mean, remember, it, it is pre Luffy, like pre advanced Osration Luffy, pre Conqueror's um, Coding Luffy. Granted. But that still was Luffy off of um, defeating uh, Doflamingo and Dress Rosa. So, like, ah, Cracker had his feet against Luffy. And that fight, it was legit extreme diff because of the whole situation. Because Cracker was literally spamming. He was spamming those, the, the Cracker soldiers. And, yeah, remember, that, that's, that's kind of, like, OP. When, whenever you have an ability to make your own soldiers... Like, like a, a, a prince from the marines, like prince from the marines, he creates his own soldiers to fight for him. Cracker, he could do the same thing. He, so he, he created an army. He created an army with ease with, with his, with his devil fruit powers. Just like Big Mom. She literally conjured a whole... It was a, a, like she conjured the attack to be alive itself. The attack itself was alive. It's like, what? Oh, no, those feats are crazy. Pairing the two. So... Bing. Now we're going to move on to narrative. Now, narrative is very integral to scaling, as without it, a lot of things do fall apart, and I'm going to explain why. The reason narrative is so integral to stories, and especially battle shonen, is because the longer the story goes on, people want to see the main character get challenged. So, if their competition stays stagnant or gets weaker, what is the point of us even viewing it? We're just going to see the main character win every single time, and that is something that we do not want to see. And so that's why with every single important battle shonen that's out there, or just even main fiction story that's out there, the competitors always get stronger. Why? It's because it makes a better story and it keeps us interested. In One Piece, there are many characters that get boosted by narrative, but the one character that we all look at when it comes to this is Crocodile. Crocodile lost to a pre skypea Luffy, while in Marineford he's clashing with people like Mihawk and Dofflin. And that's why narrative scaling is so integral to all these discussions and debates. It's because with narrative, we know that the longer we go on, the stronger the opposition is going to be. There is a reason why people can sit here and say, oh yeah, we know that Katakuri is stronger than Doflamingo, even before Katakuri even makes a move. We knew that he was going to fight Luffy, and then when he started fighting Luffy, he was like, yeah, definitely stronger than Doflamingo. It doesn't even need to be explained. There's a reason why we can easily say that the certain characters that will appear later on in the story will be stronger than Kaido, is because, well, Kaido fought Luffy back in Wano, and only fought Luffy when he just got gear 5. We know that when the layer characters down the line are going to fire him, we know that he's going to have better control over gear 5 and his hockey may improve. So yeah, they're going to be stronger than Kaido. Especially in the series like... Hmm. 
Hello? that one piece where new techniques get introduced all the time like obviously haki with both time skip and whatnot we know that when the story goes on they're more likely that things are going to get revealed meaning that characters later on in the story are going to be stronger than characters early on in the story but the exact same way feats can be misconstrued narrative can be misconstrued as well and it doesn't mean that every single time we see a new opponent they need to be stronger than the last for True. instance luchi is not stronger than enel enel would have fried luchi if luchi Ooh, that's a good argument right there. You gotta remember Lucci. I mean, I'm not saying Lucci is top tier, but Lucci is strong though. Especially with the awakening that he had recently. Mmm. But you gotta remember, Enu has better alteration hockey, and he has better attack power. So that right there is what he has over Lucci. Hmm. I think Eno. I think Eno. He ever dared to come in his vicinity. The reason Eno lost wasn't because Luffy was stronger than him. It was because he was his worst enemy, and that was someone Eno wasn't prepared to fight. And then on top of that, because he was rattled by Luffy's appearance, he couldn't use his haki properly, so he lost. Things like this do exist in the One Piece verse, and I think that's something that we do need to take into consideration when we're talking about this. Most of the time, narrative is something that you should follow because, as I said with fees, it's right in front of your face, so you're able to just see, okay, natural progression. But then on top of that, with One Piece, especially with One Piece, there are certain matchups that we will get that will be like, okay, cool. They may not be as strong as the last opponent, but because they can do certain things different to the last opponent, we then need to sit back and be like, okay, 
this is something that the main character is going to struggle with. A great example of this would be Zoro versus Shiryu in the future. I do not believe that Shiryu is stronger than King, but the only reason being Shiryu will give Zoro a tougher fight than King is because Shiryu is a tactical fighter, meaning he'll make Zoro think more and it's going to lead to Zoro awakening something. A raw strength. But think about it, no, but King is. Bro, King will wipe Shiryu, bro. I get it. Shiryu is. He probably the better swordsman. Because that, that, that's his whole thing. King, he's just a person who likes swords. He's just a person who likes swords. He's not really a good swordsman. What's in the sword play and sword techniques? It's just, uh, Shuru is a better swordsman. But King will wipe him, bro. And especially with Shuru, if, if you have good enough observation hockey, like a guard. And Zoro has good observation hockey, like a Sanji, Luffy. It's up to not, not, not on the same level, but it's pretty good. Zoro would right. Zoro would have an easier time fighting Shuru than King, because even King um Zoro learned the whole the weakness of of King power. He still put up a good fight, so it was it was, it was still extreme death, bro. I believe he pales in comparison to King, but as I just said, he has different ways of attacking Zoro, and this will lead to Zoro to obviously change his fighting style and make one that can defeat Shiryu. Unlike with King, who King for Zoro is just kind of his regular fight. He has to figure out his opponent, and then he deals with him. And with that being said, I feel like I've covered everything I need to cover for narrative for right now. So why don't we get into the comparisons and truly find out which means more to power scaling? Now with the feats and narrative argument, it just depends on how you view the story. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, I view it one way and I'm going to explain that way. I see the story as until proven wrong, I believe that the next opponent we fight needs to be stronger than the last just because of story progression. And with that being said, yes, I do believe that narrative does be feats, but don't worry, don't get, don't get angry just yet if you're on the feats side, I'm going to explain why narrative is better than feats. I mean, I get that point. But it all, all had to be the case. It all, all had to be the case in some situations. Fancy, yeah, like yeah, Katakuri he fought. Lil Luffy has fought Katakuri, and that was an extreme death. And then he went up to fight, fight Kaido, which is even more more powerful. And then Egghead he fought the elders. He had a clash with the elders and the admiral. But we know the admiral is not stronger than than Kaido. But he also had to deal with the elders and the admiral. Did that off the time skip in Fishman Island? He fought Horty. And Horty was a solid fishman, but he wasn't like a powerful. And then went on to fight Caesar, who's more powerful than, than Horty. And after Caesar, he went on to fight the Flamingo. So, like, most for the most part, he fought. A stronger um, antagonist each arc. Narrative is the crutch of everything that we even talk about. With narrative, we are able to give betrayal, we're then able to then give feats, and in a way as well, you can also say give statements as well, since with the narrative, certain statements will be made. The reason I say feats can be created by narrative is because a thing like Kaido not killing Kinemon with that one attack is kind of like, bro. Kinemon should be dead from that, but he survives because the narrative wants him to survive, meaning the narrative gave, gave Kinemon a feat. Another reason I say that narrative is better than feats is because it can give us patrol. With a character coming later on down the line, we can also say they have greater patrol than other characters, meaning that the narrative is important, their patrol, meaning yes, you do owe it to narrative for giving that person a patrol, allowing you to scale up with that other person. It may sound like gibberish, but it kind of, that's just how the story works. Like, one character can come out later, they have higher patrol than someone, but the narrative gives them that patrol because they came later. I hope that makes sense. Another reason we like to use narrative or feats is because, yes, feats just give you the certain things to skill one character at a certain point in time, but we know that the narrative is supporting the other character. For instance, Blackbeard. Blackbeard is supported by the narrative, so we're able to say, yes, Blackbeard can be stronger than Kaido because later on he's going to fight a Luffy that is stronger, and we know that Blackbeard is probably going to push him to them lengths. So, yes, Blackbeard is stronger than Kaido. The same thing goes on for Emu, and it could go on for Loki if Loki fights Luffy and it's an actual fight. But we do know there are certain conditions around narrative to where it's like, okay, cool, we may need to hold back on it. But for the most part, aside from like two or maybe even just one instance in the whole series, we're like, okay, cool. This one character should be stronger than the last, and it just continuously goes on. 
another way to prove that narrative is over fees is because if you look at everybody's top 15 in one piece you could not sit here and tell me that every character on that list has a fee i know everybody has my ability is called instant death to any target if i simply think that i want to kill Miyok in their top 15 mm -hmm. but he hasn't done a single thing that's onto the level of even current Zoro right now yet we do know because of narrative that Miyok is stronger than Zoro every character has some sort of narrative implication in that top 15 and that is the reason they are there narrative implications are everything and narrative implications give people betrayal so that means that narrative naturally is going to be stronger than feats mm. all of the time ah see not all the time though Cause what I said, like for instance, what I said about a Kaino or a Blackbeard, like Black, this is Blackbeard, Blackbeard, bro, bro. Narrative wise, he is being built up. He been built up to be a possible or more frequently an antagonist for Luffy, but but off the, off the feats alone, Luffy's will beat Blackbeard, so Blackbeard wouldn't win against Luffy. He has a chance to win, obviously, because he has the Quake Fruit and the Dark Fruit. But come on now. Luffy's winning. I, I give his point with the narrative wise. Because narrative wise, you can say Garland is like Yonko level. Narrative wise, you can say Dragon, the most wanted man, the most, I think, most dangerous criminal. The most, the most wanted criminal in the world. he he been built up, like, narrative wise. He's like Yonko level. Bare minimum Admiral level. Just like Mihawk, narrative wise. We see some of his feats, but they're really good feats. But narrative wise, Mihawk been built up to be like Yonko level to where Zoro has to get to Yonko level as a swordsman and beat Mihawk. So it's like, I get it. But I'm still taking feats over narrative. The best way I'd use narrative and feats in conjunction with each other if you want to argue that one is over the other is I'd say that narrative can be debunked sometimes through feats, meaning that, okay, one character may not do as well as another that came before them in the story and able to use their feats to be like, okay, well, this is what happened. That is the only time that you can say that narrative is weaker than feats. But aside from that, which rarely happens in these type of stories, especially shown stories, yeah, we're going to have to look at narrative as the way forward. So as a bonus, since I know a lot of people do like to hear these sort of things, I want to rank all four of them. Since I did do this before, but I want to do it now and see, okay, which one is better? Narrative, betrayal, feats, or statements? Personally, I like to take narrative over all of them since narrative ah. implications give us every single last one of them, aside from, I don't know, statements. Maybe statements is the only one that's in like a great area where it's like it doesn't really need narrative for it. But for statements, we also do kind of need feats for it. But it's like with all of these four metrics, they all are woven into each other. And without one of them, the others can't work. The only one that can really stand on its own is narrative. Aside from that, statements does need some sort of backing since a statement, as we know, can be proven false with feats are shown or the patrol just doesn't match up. And if the narrative doesn't really want to add up with it as well, statements can be torn to shreds. And now, if you were to tell me which one would I choose between patrol and statements, I do believe feats is fourth. Fourth will always be feats because the other three can work without feats even being a thing since, as I said before, look at everybody's top 15 list. Not everybody on that list has a feat. Like, obviously, there are people on there that have feats like Shanks and whatnot, but others like Mihawk and Dragon don't have feats yet. So See, that's what I'm saying. And that's why they've been built up to be top tier. So that's the thing. But, man... Statements and patrol and patrol obviously is boosted by statements and statements are boosted by patrol But personally, I would take patrol than statements since with patrol we're able to see okay cool This character is being portrayed as somebody strong, but also it could come from statements So I feel like these two are tied if you want to say one is above the other like statements is above patrol or patrol is above statements I don't really think I'll have like a massive disagreement with you But I do think that patrol and statements are kind of intertwined too much with each other so yeah, I wouldn't say that they're both tired. Maybe even Steam was just a little bit of a patrol. But I do think patrol is something that people do need to look out for. But because it's fueled so much by Steamers and probably even Feast and Narrative, it's like, eh, it could be two, could be three. I'm not really too bold with it. Mm. But if I was a rank them, I would put Narrative at one, two and three, Steamers and Patrol, whichever way you want to go. And then at fourth, we have Feet. Hey, Feet at four? Ah. I probably go see as a thing. I go feast one, narrative two, stems and patrol three. But feast, I mean, stems and patrol, stems 
kind of going hand in hand with Feast though. Just like how it was stated that that Kuza and Kainu fought for ten days, which is also a feat for both characters. So like, eh. Yes. Yeah, I said in the video, I could have gone over the other two a little bit more, but I mean, look, listen, you guys wanted Feast versus Narrative, so I gave you Feast versus Narrative. I did cover the other two in like a longer video a time ago, and... Yeah, I get it, though. I get it, though. I get what he's saying. I get what, I get the whole point. But man, I'd rather take Feast over number one overall. <laughs>